the 20th anniversary, the All-Star Jam was just put on by Lemmy. You know, Lemmy, Motorhead was the last band to play the Cat House. And they played Cat House stuff all the time. Lemmy was a very, very good friend and did so much great stuff for me. And, uh, you know, we didn't have Lemmy around for the Cat House 30th anniversary. So I had all these different people doing an All-Star Jam, playing Motorhead songs. And I had Corey Parks. She was a bass player in this band, Nashville Pussy. Pussy, And she's this big, six six pretty girl big boobs tattooed that played bass and she was good friends with lemmy and she's playing bass and doing motorhead she fucking goes and blows out fire that goes over the whole fucking crowd and i'm like what the hell are you doing Corey? and it, but it was just it it was like down dirty and it was great so if i did a cat house 40th anniversary it'd probably be called rockers with walkers but <laughs> It still has to be great. And I don't know how many bands can bring it. And it can't be someplace big. It's got to be something. And to be honest, if there's a Cat House 40th anniversary, Guns N' Roses has to be involved somehow. Yeah. It's got to be something with Guns because there's not going to be a Cat House 50th anniversary or 51st anniversary you or were, a Cat House tour. You were friends with them way before they hit anything, right? Was Guns N' Roses? Yeah. I owe everything to Guns N' Roses. I, owe, I mean, I'm the first to say that I owe, I owe my career to Axel, I'm the first one to say that. I mean, he called up MTV to set up my audition. He went with me to New York for my audition. Okay, you know, really, Axel, I didn't know if that was exaggerated. That's really how no, it went down, absolutely. huh? Absolutely. Axel was wearing Cat House shirts all the time. Axel would give shout outs to me in the Cat House. And, you know, and then when it came to doing the It's So Easy video, mm -hmm. they said, look, let's play the Cat House. And this was like, just before they were playing with the Rolling Stones in front of 100,000 people. And now they're playing Cat House with a full-blown film crew. And, uh, you know, Alan Niven, who you saw in Nothing But A Good Time, and he yeah. was a manager, he said that was the best show Guns N' Roses ever played. What we did, instead of, like, tickets, I made these flyers that Axel did the artwork, and they were simple. It said, bring this flyer in five bucks, and you get to see Guns N' Roses, right? And then we took it to Alan Niven's office, and there was some embossed stamp. Yeah. And, um... And so we stamped each one so it couldn't have been forged. And then I'm looking, I'm like, I've got two of, oh, I've found two of them. I'm like, that's, I didn't even think like, you know, these things are worth a shitload of money. I'm like, they are? Like, I've got all this stuff that I didn't even realize <laughs> right, got, is worth a lot of money. Yeah, you're on a treasure trove. I didn't even how know. How did you guys it. meet? How did that, how, how long did you guys know each other? It was, it was probably in the very, very early days, like maybe the first night of the cat house. I think I met Duff first at Denny's and invited him to the Cat House. But just for just for uh, it's 1986. Details. Okay, this so is sep this is September 1986. Okay, and then I know that Axel came to the Cat House and I became friends with those guys. So I would tell the doorman, the guest list is at Guns N' Roses plus anything, and they weren't right. big. The reason that I let Guns N' Roses in is because these guys were my friends, and they're baddest band around because Guns N' Roses the beauty of Guns N' Roses is you never knew if you were going to get a three hour show or if Axel was going to kick somebody's teeth in and play for four minutes because Guns N' Roses was dangerous and Guns N' Roses was raw and that's why seeing Guns N' Roses back then greatest rock and roll band period in like 86 I think the two people that you didn't ever fuck with in Hollywood were Axel or Frank Starr because they will kick your ass. That's what I remember. Like both those guys, like they were le like they're legit. Like short anybody, fuse anybody, or... anybody, oh, short Axel, short fuse. But anybody that that tells you they're a bad boy is not a bad boy. We're bad boys. You're fucking stupid. You know. I mean, they were bad boys. When you see a band that before they were signed, where are they? Play if they're not playing at the whiskey, they're not playing at the you know those venues. Where are they playing that you can see them? You're like, oh my god, no one's ever like. Where do you go? That was where they played. Where nobody played, ever like, hears of them. Like I rented out the Roxy and promoted them for two nights. And one night I had, I think Fast Pussy Cat open. The other night I had LA Guns open or something okay. like that. And um, but there's no like backyard parties people see them at or things like that. Like where they're like there were random they're... shows. I mean the backyard parties. Those are all like to me. Those are like the Van Halen stories. Okay, you know we would see them. The whiskey, the Roxy. I remember Stephen Adler calling me and he's like, "Dude, we're opening up for Cheap Trick tonight in Long Beach. I think or Perkins Palace. No, I think it was Long Beach Fender's Ballroom." He goes, we're opening up for Cheap Trick tonight. I'm like, right on. He's like, yeah. And I, he goes, I got to get to, the, I'm like, 
you're playing tonight with Cheap Trick. You don't know how you're going to get in the show. He's like, oh, I didn't even think about it. I'm like, let's go. So I drove him to the show and they were opening up for Cheap Trick and I saw him opening up for all these bands. Yeah. Now you have to understand that was the way we lived. So while people are saying, oh my God, you were watching Guns N' Roses play the small clubs. How crazy it was. It was like, if you go to a local bar and you see your friends, you're like, this is, fan. This is just how you live. I mean, right. yes, it really, I mean, to say sex and drugs, it was sex, 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 drugs and rock and roll. And that's just how we lived, you know? And I'm kind of n- not numb, but it was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. I can never stop praising Guns N' Roses because not only are they the freaking greatest, but they were legit. Mm-hmm. They're so legit, you know. That you know, talking about especially especially Guns N' Roses, um, and there's other bands too. But that will 50 years from now, you're still going to be listening to, to Guns N' Roses. They're going to be like you know the Rolling Stones. They are, you know. Um, and there's a lot of music that came out of that fucking era that that will will be like that. You're just going to keep listening to these guys. I remember when Appetite for Destruction entered the top 40. And I said, dude, you're a top 40 band now, not knowing it'd be number one for a gajillion years. But going to a sporting event and they played Welcome to the Jungle. And I was like, they're playing. Like, it's still weird for me. And it's played at every sport. It's played at everything. Today, they'll play it And today. it's just still like weird. Like, I have to say, like, wow, like this is GNR. And you've got kids that are 10 years old that are listening to Guns N' Roses. Now, oh, think yeah. about this bands like Guns N' Roses were 40 years ago now if I was at the cat house and I'm listening to bands that are 40 years ago I'm not talking Elvis Presley <laughs> no. I'm talking fucking Glenn Miller <laughs> that was the music that was on in the 40s so Thank if you, you want to talk That's about a generation crazy. gap like in the 80s I, I was a rockabilly cat so in the 80s you didn't listen to music by Eddie Cochran Gene Vincent which is only 30 years away you know, no, it, so still it's my, that, that's what that, that's my point that I'm saying. It's crazy. It's, it transcends. This is music that they should have put up on Voyager. The next Voyager satellite to go. They will put they put Rolling Stones on the first Voyager satellite. They would put GNR on now. You put Master of Puppets, no one's going to fuck with us. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Don't> like, leave <laughs> that no. planet alone. <laughs> Chris, you're, you're talking about low hanging fruit places. Obviously, everybody knows the whiskey, the Roxy, the Troubadour. But I want to ask Ricky if he saw, if you ever, your favorite memories from a couple of places, because I've tried to prepare a couple of questions from an 80s geek that I haven't heard you talk about yet from the scene. Madam Wong's. So Madam Wong's was was important for a couple reasons. Because Madam Wong's, they had two. They had Madam Wong's on Santa Monica Boulevard, and then they had Madam, Madam Wong's, Wong's East, in Chinatown. Chinatown yeah. Now, when I started going to punk rock shows, the very first punk rock show, there was Madame Wong's and there was Cafe de Grand. And they were both next to each other. And the first punk rock show I ever went to was Black Flag when Keith Morse was a singer. The Germs, Fear. I don't remember. It's Chinas Comitas, but I remember that's when I first time I ever saw The Germs. And uh, it was a great punk rock venue. And then Madame Wong's West was on Santa Monica Boulevard. So I decided, while I'm still loaded, I decided, look, I, Ricky Rackman, have got the hottest club around. I want to do New Year's Eve parties. So I started doing my New Year's Eve parties at Madame Wong's. And the lines were massive. And I had two stories. And the stage was like this big. And I remember I had dancing play, And I never announced bands. Like, a lot of times what they would do in L.A., they go bands too big to be announced and like do a little hint you know I never did because I knew I was going to sell out anyway so I want people to be surprised and also because I didn't know who was going to play so I had Danzig play one time and Shannon Hoon from Blind Melon stood on the stage to work as security I'd have Guns N' Roses I'd have Suicidal Tendencies and all the regular Cat House bands and so I would do Madame Wong's on New Year's, and then I said, well, I'm gonna do one on my birthday, which is June, so I would do those two nights, and I remember that like one night, I made like 10 or 15 grand cash at the door, and I remember- <laughs> Back I remember, then, that was a lot of money. Sure. It's a lot of money now. <laughs> it is. And I remember saying on stage, which was such a horrible thing to say, and so stupid too, I remember saying, it's like, thank you so much, everybody, I'm gonna go buy a jet ski. Okay, why I said jet ski, I, no <laughs> yes. I never bought a jet ski, but I've yes, never ever told ski. people, 
I don't think I've ever changed whether I made lots of money or didn't. Right. You know, there's there's very few things I own in my life today that are like a little gratuitous, you know, and um, and I never wanted to be that like, look at me, I'm the club promoter and this and that, except I start buying nicer cars and stuff like this. But um, yeah, I would make money on those shows. I love the idea of not telling who's playing. Nobody could pull that off. Fucking no. Nobody could. No, but then it got gonna... to the point. But then it got to the point that everybody thought when I said, you know, and bands that I'm not announcing, that to a lot of people meant it was Guns and Roses. So you'd show up and it might not be Guns and Roses. I mean, when when Megadeth played the Cat House, and I didn't announce who it was, it was Vic and the Rattleheads, which most people knew was Megadeth. With Body Count, with Ice T's band. They weren't, they were banned from playing anywhere, you know, with suicidal tendencies. They were banned from playing. So certain bands I, I couldn't really announce. And the beauty is that when the cat house was open, if we had, let's say, I'll just say Jackal, or I'm just going to mention a random band. If we had Jackal play the cat house, let's say there's 600 people there. And the next week it's going to be Wild West Night where we all dress like cowboys and stupid stuff. There's still going to be 600 people there with no bands. It's like we were just the same yeah. amount of people like every week and it didn't matter who played. From what I've heard, what I heard the lore of the Cat House, again, I'm behind you guys, so I got to hear it secondhand, was Ricky had the scene so tightly paying attention to him that if he announced the band, it was less hype than if he said, we're not announcing. Like people automatically, oh, oh sure. I got to be there in case, yeah. just in case. Because he's you're in tune to everybody. It could but, be, it but could the be biggest, anybody. and then all of a sudden, that guy that owns the cat house is on television with the Headbangers Ball. So now I'm like, you know, every band that would be on Headbangers Ball wanted to play the cat house. So then, like Stone Temple Pilots, can we play the cat house? All these bands are Primus, can we play? The, all these bands want to play the cat house because now Ricky Rackman isn't just the cat house guy; he's the guy from Headbangers Ball. You know, I must have been a prick back then to deal with. I can imagine that I was not such a great guy because, you know, when you're the guy in high school, and this is going to sound bad to say, but when you're the guy in high school that was too scared to talk to girls, that girls didn't want to talk to you because you were a punk rocker, and maybe, you know, I lost my virginity just before I turned 18, and maybe like at, you know, 19 or 20, maybe I'd had sex with two girls, and then all of a sudden you open up the cat house. And you can have like as many beautiful women as you want. You get a little ego boost. Like, like all of a sudden it's like, I can, and I was a womanizer. I was a drug addict. That, and the problem, and the problem is I keep on getting rewarded. <laughs> like I'm this drug addict that's fucking yeah. all these girls right. and the money keeps rolling in. It's like, well, are you going to get sober? Why get sober when all yep. these things were happening? Scumbag incorporated, but it wow. worked out, right? <laughs> it worked great. I got two more clubs to ask you about. And you don't have to, this, these are valid I clubs. am not scared to answer anything. Well, I just want to hear, just as a fan and a guy who followed you, I've never heard you talk about these places. The country club. I got arrested there. Oh, what did you do at the country club, can you say? Yeah. I went there and I think Poison was playing. And me and the Cat House alumni went backstage. And like we always did, we caused shit. And there was a birthday cake there. And I think what happened was Bobby Dahl threw a cake at somebody. And then I grabbed cake and started throwing at it and threw cake at a security guard. <laughs> and they he came up to me and he put me in handcuffs and he threw me on a chair and he said, you're going to jail. I'm like, you know, I, I was a dick to security guard. I mean, Put it this way, if security guard said I'm gonna have to throw you out, I'm like, okay. But I the one thing, and I'm not I'm not a big guy, I'm not a tough guy, but I don't like being touched by security guards when they don't need to. When somebody grabs me, I got pissed. And I always had big friends. They were my sponsors, they were my they were my friends before I got known. And so it usually shit would break out. But I remember the security guard grabbed me and he and he set me down and he said, You're gonna go to jail. And he said, Who's the guy that threw the first piece of cake? And I don't rat people out. I never did. I never will. And even though Bobby Doll wasn't my great friend, I'm not going to rat Bobby Doll out. You know, he's a, a good great. dude. And so, so he says, "I'm going to place you under citizen's arrest." And when somebody <laughs> places you under, when somebody places you under citizen's arrest, and the cops come, they have to arrest you and take you to jail. But 
that leaves the person that placed the citizen's arrest open for a lawsuit. So what happened is they picked me up, they took me to jail. My friend Keith was with me. So Keith was calling the security guard like, oh, cake face, you can't put him in. Just kept on calling the guy cake face. So they go, you're going to jail too. So they threw Keith in jail. So they threw both of us in jail. And Scotty Ross, who managed Poison, bailed me out of jail, but didn't bail Keith out. <laughs> so Keith, who's now still one of my best friends, is a successful attorney. Keith ended up staying in jail and didn't even get bailed out of jail. So that's my my recollection of the country club. Country club was in the valley, Reseda. which was, was was which was cross street from like a skateboard park, my first skateboard park. And a country club was in the valley. So country club got a lot of the big bands. I remember Leather Wolf was a big band at the time. And all the bands played the country club. But to go to the valley, when you live in Hollywood, you don't go to the valley. If you live in the valley, you go to Hollywood. Right. But it's like, you know, if we're here in North Carolina, I live in a town called Mooresville. Now, if I put a cat house in Mooresville, people from Charlotte probably, I don't know, probably from Charlotte might not go to Mooresville, but if I put a club in Charlotte, people from Mooresville would go to, does that make any sense? I don't 100%. know if the North Carolina example works, but. No, but, it does. Uh, every, because every, everybody's got the same kind of towns. They, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's, like, your small town, I'll, big I'll give town you an example. thing, right? Um, you know what TMZ means? Mm -hmm. 30 course, mile zone. Yeah. 30 mile zone. And it was our 30 mile zone in Hollywood. Yeah. And you didn't venture out of the 30 mm -hmm. mile zone, but ours was like the 10 mile zone. So we had the Whiskey Roxy. Um, maybe you'd go a little bit further down east or maybe yeah. Santa Monica for Madame Wong's. But you didn't come to the valley. But occasionally we'd go to Country Club because they'd have good shows.